Hey, everybody, welcome to the Gym Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show Series. How's everybody doing today? So good to see all your smiley faces and hope you're having a good day. If you're not having a good day, well, you've come to the right spot on the dial. That's right. Is it a dial when it is the internet? I mean, I work in TV and radio and we always use dials, but aren't you glad you use dial? Uh, wherever you are, you're at Gym Masters TV on our YouTube channel and you're watching the Gym Masters show live. And we're so glad that you are. We love our viewers. They call themselves the Lovities. They come from all around the world. Yes, the United States and Canada, Europe, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Africa north south east west and in between and we love it thanks to all the comments the tweets the instagram messages and posts sharing the youtube episode links on all of your social media thanks for the comments dropping comments on our youtube episodes as well we love that that helps us continue to spread the word and just thanks for being you thanks for coming along here and whatever it is you get from our series entertainment smiles inspiration education just a good place to stop by and feel good. Thanks for being with us. We really appreciate that. We have uh, somewhere around 670 episodes that we have knocked out of the park, <laughs> as George Burns would say, and he'll be here in a minute. Uh, knocked out of the park for all of you, all this great content, all these episodes, all these poignant conversations, amazing entertainment, lots of levity, and this community on the Jim Masters Show Live that isn't just a podcast, isn't just you know throwing up streams on the net. We're, we've created something really special here, coming with you and at you together sort of inspiring and having a good time. And again, with all these episodes, you can really have an amazing binge party watching all these episodes. We're also going on a cruise to Bermuda, the Lovety Cruise. Uh, that's in May of next year. If you want to know more about that incredible cruise, special guests and food and just lots of beautiful times on the cruise ship, Norwegian Prima. And that's going to take us to beautiful Bermuda, leaving from New York. It's going to be amazing. Uh, inquire within. We'll tell you more about all of that. And uh, we're celebrating our two-year anniversary. And we're working on a special uh, with that as well. And some of our guests have been sending in these really cool videos uh, telling us why they enjoy the show. And if the viewers would like to send in a video to us, letting us know why you enjoy our show, do it. Send it to us as soon as you can so we can include you. Maybe you will have an opportunity to be seen right here worldwide on the one and only Jim Masters show live hosted by me, Jim Masters. Good to see you guys. Thanks for joining us. Now, if you would like to be a part of our JMS Lovity Squad chat room, which is open and available right now while the show is live. Yes, when the show is live, our chat room is available. Now, if you ever miss the opportunity to chat while the show is live, don't worry. You can always drop a comment on the YouTube channel under every episode. And don't forget, you know, while you're doing that, spread the sunshine and tell everybody about our series. But if you would like to comment with each other. A lot of, of our guests like to uh, do that or our viewers like to do that, which I think is fantastic. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel because just looking at all these comments built up here, we can see them over here. Um, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel because that's a special gift for our subscribers to our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. When you subscribe and you click that red button, you get to be a part of the chat room. But also when you subscribe, it allows us to uh, let you know about upcoming episodes, special surprises, pop-up shows, and so much more. So while you also, if you love our show, give us a thumbs up like. Yes, leave a comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We would absolutely love that. Yes, look for that red button there. Hit that. There's no cost for that. That's right. When you subscribe, there's no cost. Isn't that amazing? Something where there's no cost for a change in this world. Uh, no cost. It just lets you know uh, that you're a part of our uh, show and our family, and it lets us know that you are as well. And we thank every single one of you who has subscribed to our YouTube channel. That helps us grow. It helps our videos or episodes to get out to more people when you do that. So thanks so very, very much for doing that. Uh, again, comments are built up here, which we love. 
I always like to have, you know, a little chat in the beginning of the show. Think of this like Dick Cavett, Johnny Carson, Regis Feldman, some of the old school talk show hosts where the host chats with the audience, the viewers first, and then brings on a fantastic guest. And that's what we like to do. We're doing this in a talk show style, like a television talk show style. And that's how we've been doing it uh, ever since we launched the show. We do have an amazing guest that's joining us uh, live and direct from Los Angeles, California. You better believe it. Ralph Cole Jr. You've seen him on television and film and, and so much more. A lot of great shows, too. Primetime TV star and actor Ralph Cole Jr. is with us. And he is absolutely hilarious, too. His comedic timing is extraordinary. Ever since uh, he was born, <laughs> the hilarity started and his comedic timing actually started. It's been traced back to Burbank Hospital in California, where his uh, intern father proudly assisted in his delivery. That's right. <laughs> Not his comedic delivery, but the actual delivery of Ralph. <laughs> the comedic delivery he sort of developed on his own. From that event on, equally encouraged by his school teacher mom, Ralph was destined to become an energetic crowd pleaser, pleaser on stage, film, and television. Remaining an only child uh, lent its way to Ralph's various characters and musical enthusiasm to emerge and flourish. Uh, extraordinarily. And uh, he studied at the City Cultural Center, UCLA Productions, uh, Born Yesterday and Lock of Your Daughters, introduced Ralph to his first summer stock experience and how important he felt when he was cast as Chinese in LA's Young Actors Theater production of Flower Drum Song as well. Uh, then, of course, on to the Big Apple, perfect town for Ralph because the energies blended and soared. Everything from word processing jobs were plentiful, of course. Ralph's he, Ralph balanced his freelance work with classes and auditions, too. And uh, off-Broadway and regional theaters enabled him to hone his crafts in such hits as The Torchbearers, La Caja Fall, Dream Girls, My Fair Lady, Grand Hotel, and so much more. Performed stand-up comedy in New York City venues as well, and comedy improvisation on and on with Shock of the Funny. And Broadway welcomed him in Bigger Than Bubblegum, the musical story of the emotions, Back in L.A., worked with the Pasadena Playhouse and so much more. He also won, um, he also creation of the plum roll Babalu, which I think is fantastic, garnered him the role or the award from the NWCP for the role. It's the theater award for best supporting actor and the Playhouse Friends recognizing entertaining drama Fred Award for most entertaining actor as well. Now you've seen him in a lot of shows too on television, a lot of them. Scrubs, that's right. Scrubs was one of them. You remember that on NBC, right? NCIS, you've seen him in Mr. Mayor, Boy Culture, Snowfall, Mom, uh, Two and a Half Men, Coffee House, Chronicles, The Real Bros of Simi Valley, uh, Harry's Law, The Whole Truth, Desperate Housewives, Dexter, Cold Case, 20 Good Years, and on and on and on. Really cool stuff. And that's just the short list. Uh, also, the NAACP Theater Award winner returns to the stage for Brothers of the Desert's annual night of storytelling, Brothers Got Talent, in May as well, which is very, very special. Uh, so there you are looking at a fabulous face. I know which one you like the most. <laughs> I know of all those faces you see there. Uh, it's the one where he's got his mouth open and you know what it is? That's when he, that's the look he had on his face. That second picture that you see where his mouth's opening and he's like, it looks like he just won a washer and dryer on the prices, right? That's when he heard he was going to be a guest on the Jim Masters show live series. That is when he got that uh, email or that call. That's his expression of joy and excitement. And we can verify that, gang. We can verify that because our special guest, Ralph Cole Jr., with the explanation point, of course, is joining us live right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jim. How are you? <laughs> uh, I am orange deliciously fantastic. And thank you for having me on your prestigious show. My pleasure. And, and that second picture is your expression when you found out you were coming on the show, and right? It was absolutely my expression when my publicist, Dominic Friesen, alerted me that you wanted me on your show. That is how I reacted. And I happened to have a camera nearby that was able to capture that. 
Oh, that is so great. And, yeah. and we got that and there it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how are you today? Busy, crazy? It is, you know, uh, crazy am, time. it's a crazy time and I'm busy. So uh, as we all have uh, a strive to maintain creativity and, and sanity throughout yes. these last uh, two years, um, I am happy to be one of those that is participating in uh, social activities again, you know, uh, minimally, very safely still. And I am creatively writing, which is always good. You can do that anywhere. Um, I was going to say under any circumstances, but sometimes the circumstances don't always allow you to write or express. Yes. Sometimes it's time to be internal and within yourself. And it's yes. those times when you emerge from that, where at least for me, then I am totally productive and, and effusive and ready to create and express. That's fantastic. And that really was noticed the minute you came, uh, you know, on the scene, right? When your father assisted in your delivery, they realized uh, this kid's going places. That's well, pretty early to be, uh, to notice the talent. I know. <laughs> I, I like to pride myself, Jim, that I was there bouncing baby boy. So um, yeah, I, I was born ready to perform and I, and, and making people laugh and laughing yes. myself. Um, that's just in my system. And uh, fortunately, yeah. And for, we are fortunate that we are able and have been able to pursue that. Yes. From yes. our young ages off that we haven't had to uh, uh, take a different route somewhere. Um, yeah, exactly right. I, mean, I, I have taken different routes and, I have proudly had survival jobs, which were fantastic, you know, and allowed me to keep doing what I'm doing. So I am blessed for that forever. I saw the camera moving there. You're not having an earthquake live, are you? No, no but that would go just, that would go viral. I know. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. You saw it first. You're on Jim Masters. Okay. <laughs> Earthquake live. Oh my God. No, I was just I was just looking at myself and I thought, oh, I seem a little crooked. Oh, so don't I do that. Just, You'll be yeah. thrown off. If you look at yourself, you get so thrown off. You're I like, wait a minute. Because okay, everything's wait. flipped too. It's flipped, right? It's yeah. in reverse. Yeah. It's yeah, awesome. so no, no, so I'm good. No, we are totally stable, thank goodness. <laughs> in, in, in Relatively Angeles. speaking, right? Okay, Relatively yeah. speaking. In Los Angeles. Yeah, that's all we need now is that. But no. <laughs> Let's not even say that. No, we're good. We're solid. We're stable. <laughs> good. <laughs> Should we not on a cruise ship or something? <laughs> no, no, because then I would kind of like be swaying. It would be even bobbing. Yes. Yeah. Bobbing. <laughs> yes. Have you met them? I know. Weave Weave and bob? Bob. Yeah, I've seen their They're show. They're a nice couple. Oh, yeah, they are a nice couple. They're like Burns and Allen. You know, so. <laughs> Weave, Weave and Bob. <laughs> Not to be confused with Bob and Weave at some of those birthday parties, you know, because that can get a little confusing. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so when did people realize that I was I've always been told, especially by my dad, Jim, you should should go into comedy because of a quick wit and timing. And I'm always looking for the line. I'm always looking for ways to, you know, just get some humor going. Um, not humor that hurts people, humor that just makes us laugh and, and humor about the craziness of life, things you see that's going on in front of you. When do people start to realize, hey, Ralph's funny? Honestly, it, it was around five or six years old. Early on, yes. It was, it was very early on. And I, if it's, if it sounds like I'm patting myself on the back, it's, I'm saying what I'm saying that I realized that at five or six, because what six year old does impersonations of Moms Mabley and Phyllis Diller in their living room for their parents? And I am an only child, as you mentioned, and I saw these performers on television and gravitated to them. And that was my first exposure really to comedy, you know, and um, actors such as Godfrey Cambridge. Um, I grew up during the 60s. So 
I was very influenced by the Richard Pryor and the Red Fox and the Flip Wilsons and Lucille Ball. Yeah. And Father Knows Best, I was watching with Robert Young. So I, I attribute this to one, being allowed to watch television, being this only child with my school teacher mother and prominent physician father, and getting exposed to this life of tears and life of comedy. And that coupled with getting to make my mommy laugh and make my daddy laugh at me just further incited me to keep doing it. And when I was in the Easter pageant and I've always stood out, I've always been a ham, I've always, um, enjoyed live interaction and and you say something and somebody laughs and it's like oh god that that felt good that was like eating a piece of chocolate cake (laughs) let's do that again you know and you keep doing it and doing it you end up in show business yes exactly so what was that that first uh moment for you when you got that opportunity you know obviously you had to work hard to get to to this level where you're on television and film and all these shows and all these performances but uh what was that first moment where that door opened and good things happened as a result for you ralph well let me just fast forward to um the year 2004 let's say. I had done work on television and film before that. I mean, I'll start with my television career because I, well, let me just go back a little bit into the 90s. Um, (laughs) Did you get that, folks? We're going to go to 2004, then we're going to pause, then we're going to make a sandwich, and then we're going to go into the 90s. Well, like, as as one of my best friends. We're with you, Ralph. We're with you. Okay, thank you. As one of my best friends, Longtime friend said to me, Ralph, you have to really be careful on not going off on your tangents and, you know, and keep it focused, you know, stay on topic. But to answer your question, I really, I mean, there's so many things that led up to where I am now, but I will talk about uh, my journey with um, naked boys singing, let's say. That was in the late 90s in New York City. And it was at a time when I needed my health insurance to be covered again. It was the last day. And I used to pretend, I rode a bicycle in New York City and I used to pretend I was a bike messenger. Mm. I, I would put on a, a, a different kind of outfit. And yeah. I actually, and I was so silly. I actually took a black t-shirt and shredded it all around and put that on my head with my bike helmet over that as though I had dreads, right? (laughs) And, but I wanted to look bike messenger. That's creative when you think about it, you know? Yeah, well, you know. the inflation of today, that would be affordable. (laughs) Well, yeah. I mean, when back in those days, you know, I'm riding my bike around the city. I mean, everything was hustling and bustling and you wanted a job. And um, the 90s, yes. Yeah, and when I needed a job so badly, um, it was like, how, you know, how can I get my headshot in the door? And in these casting offices in New York, very oftentimes there would be a sign on the door very prominently saying, no actors, leave headshot at the door, do mm-hmm. not enter. You're but not enter, bike, right. I've but seen bike, those, yes. And yeah, and they're, I'm sure they're still around today. But a bike messenger ignores that and goes right in and plops the headshot down. And that's mm. what I start. That's what I started doing. And I did it for Naked Boys Singing. And I got an audition. And I went to the audition downs at the Actors Playhouse, Seventh Avenue South. <clears throat> audition, booked it on the last day. That I that wasn't an earthquake. I'm sorry. The table. <laughs> okay. That was a hiccup. A hiccup. Oh, yeah. It was my hand hitting the table. Um, I booked it that day. There's a day. dog underneath his laptop. Yeah, off the table. <laughs> honey, honey. Yeah, just be still. Okay, thanks. Be still. But, yeah, but uh, I ended up booking it and regained my insurance. So that was Naked Boy singing. But you know, what was the hook? Did you make the delivery? Uh, Naked? I mean, what? How, what? <laughs> oh no! Well, I didn't have. To, I, I didn't have to. Uh, the hook was I had to sing a song, 
and I had to learn a song. Well, actually, I learned it on stage. That's right, mm. because um, the choreographer was there. I had to yeah. learn a song on stage and then learn a number uh, and for the choreo. Uh, learn the choreography for a number to see how I picked it up. And I booked it that afternoon. You know, it was just, God, when you think about it, Jim, in those days, it was like with that hustle and bustle, you could make things happen for you. Mm -hmm. You know, that was before I had an agent. That's why I was playing the bike messenger to get in. Yes. So, Good idea. Know, that, huh? There's so many, I have so many noteworthy things that I have done. And like <laughs> you and I said before the show started, I'm sure you have plenty of stories and things to say because it's such a great question that you asked. It's like, when did you know? What was the first door? Okay, let me tell you this. For years, I would have a recurring dream about being in a sassy, robust musical and that was just rip roaring and fun. Then I would wake up and be like, oh God, it was just a dream, but one day it'll happen. And one day it did with Sisterella. And so many people got to see that and experience that with me. I did three incarnations of that show. That was the show you talked about where I won the NAACP award. And <clears throat> Jim, that was an experience that changed my life in the theater uh, as myself as a performer. It was my first time touring Germany. I learned Germany, German for my part to ingratiate myself into the German audience, with the German audiences. It was a fabulous three years of my life, 95, 90, 1995, 96, and 97. We started in New York in a workshop production at Musical Theater Works. We went on to Pasadena Playhouse. What was the yeah. aim? Were you aiming for uh, theater, television, Broadway? Was there a goal, a focus? At the time, the focus was Broadway. And I, I made it to Broadway once. I, I, I should say I scored a production contract, a Broadway contract yeah, once. You did. But, at that, but at that time, the focus was Broadway and off-Broadway with stage. In those days, of course, there's always been film and TV. That wasn't accessible to me, accessible to me at that time. I, I was so focused on the theater. And I yes. was doing... They were definitely, especially at that time, they were totally separated worlds now it's much more merged everything film television stage internet everything is just all one thing almost but they were definitely everything was compartmentalized if you were you know on broadway you weren't necessarily going to be starring in a soap opera on tv or this that and the other thing there was just these sort of compartments if you're a classically trained actor you weren't necessarily going to do TV commercials for dish liquid, you know, <laughs> now it's all merged. Yeah. It's a, it's a wonderful hodgepodge. You explain that perfectly because I mean, in listening to you, yes, I could have pursued the film and TV then, but at that time it was hustling to go from show to show. And my hustle was get that Broadway show and take dance classes and voice lessons. So I'll be ready for all that. And I didn't have, like I said, I had one Broadway contract that ne it, the show never made it to the stage. We were in rehearsal when the show closed, but I did so much hustling at auditions and chorus calls, wanting to get that Broadway job, wanting to do eight shows a week, longing to leave the stage door and then go meet your best friends at their stage door and walking home or taking the subway home but I lived adjacent to that life, doing off-Broadway, hustling around on my bike, doing any reading I could do. I became stage reading king in Manhattan. And as my manager and good friend always says, say yes and, and, and work. And at that time, it was like, do whatever you can, Jim. Me, Build. I did that too. And still, yeah, I know what you mean. Build opportunity that is opportunity. It really is. And, you know, oh God, it gives me goose pimples thinking of that. And, and especially to your point about in this day and age, 
it's really especially important to say yes. I mean, when I say always say yes, there are some things that you will say no to. When I say say yes, it's meaning be open to everything in this industry. Because even though you did audition for this dishwashing commercial, like you mentioned, the person who watched you might be doing that Star Wars film. And if you just, yeah, you like, like you said, everything is such a hodgepodge it's now. All a hodgepodge. Remember those commercials for Palm Olive, Madge? Oh, yeah, they went to the nail salon and they would put the hands in and you're Palm soaking Olive. in it. Yeah, I forget her name, but she was a classically trained actress that did film and stage and so much more. And this commercial role came for her to play Madge. Same thing with, um. The, the character actor that was don't please don't squeeze the Charmin. Oh right, the, the guy. And the, you've seen him if you look back at nostalgic television from the sixties, seventies, eighties, what have you, nineties. He's in like everything. He's in uh, All in the Family. He's in the Dick Van Dyke. I mean, this guy's been in so many different TV shows. Mm -hmm. But then he got this one part where he got to play for years. Mr. Charmin, you know, please don't squeeze the Charmin. And sometimes those things can, you know, we think that that's all they're doing, but their resume of incredible production and theater and training and, and other television and film is extraordinary. Well, exactly. And to your point, I'm thinking of Vivian Vance from the I Love Lucy show. They, Rick, Desi Arnaz discovered her at a, at a play, performing in a play. She was a, a, a noted theater actress and so many of us might only know her from I Love Lucy and as being Ethel Mertz. as Ethel Mertz yeah. so you're absolutely right and I love those kind of performers like yeah. say an Ida Lupino or yeah. a Barbara Stanwyck or a Myrna Loy the, everybody was a workhorse and they they just want to work you know and uh that's why you're saying about uh, uh, Mr. Charmin, it's like, rather than him saying, it's like, oh no, I don't do commercials. It's like, yeah, let's bring it. And especially in this day and age, the noted actors that we know are spokespeople for the products that we love. It's all an incestuous hodgepodge of let me use your Shakespearean talent to sell my Paul Olive, you know, so exactly. it, it's great. And, and when casting directors and producers and showrunners and network executives are willing to, to open their doors to that, it's wonderful for all of us rather than being shut out or saying, or being stereotyped like, oh no, you can only do this or only do that. Absolutely. Absolutely right. So, you know, as things were developing for you, um, I know Scrubs was something, everybody knows that show, that came at a time that was an interesting time in your life when things were happening. Tell us about the opportunity to be a part of Scrubs on NBC and some of what was happening in your world at the same time. Wow. Uh Jim, thank you. You just gave me goose pimples. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a I was a parental caregiver, and at that time I was looking after my father, and who, like I mentioned, was a prominent physician for 50, 50 years in Los Angeles. I was living back and forth from Los Angeles. I was living in New York, but I had moved back home to start taking care of my father, and. I, that was in the year 2000. So I would be here in Los Angeles for 10 months and then I would go back to New York, always scrambling, trying to look for work, which wasn't working, you know, like I'd be in New York for a few months trying to look for work and it didn't happen. And then I'd come back to LA to look after my father. And I was taking casting directing workshops when I was here in Los Angeles. And those workshops were designed for casting directors to meet actors and vice versa. And I was enrolled in one of these classes and I went. And that particular night, the casting director that was scheduled was unable to attend. And they were replaced with an agent. And so this agent got to see me do my work. And what they would do in these workshops, the agent would go through our headshots and he or she would have brought various scenes from the TV shows or movies that they've cast. 
and they would assign actors based on their headshot. Ralph, you'll read George, Jim, you'll read Bill, and they would cast scenes that way. You'd go out into the hallway for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, learn the scene, go over it with your scene partner, and then come back into the room to perform it for the agent of the casting director. There were like 20 or 30 students in the class. And when I went and did mine, everybody was paired up, but me for some reason. So the agent actually read opposite me. And she laughed so hard at my scene. And I had the scene memorized, which wasn't required, but that's just something I always like to do, that we really connected and bonded. Yeah. I came back to New York on one of my breaks from taking care of my father. And when I wasn't taking care of my, looking after my dad, my mother was well enough then to pitch in and help. And I was sitting at my desk in New York thinking, I need an agent. Why don't I contact this woman that I met and ask her if she'll be my agent? And I emailed her, Jim, and was just completely high. We had such a fun time during the casting director workshop. Would she be my agent? I'll be coming back to Los Angeles to resume taking care of my father. She wrote that. Which is beautiful, yeah. Yes. So I had my agency with Liz Hanley at Bicoastal Talent. So when and you approached her, how did you do it? Did you say, won't you be, won't you be, please won't you be my agent? <laughs> my agent. <laughs> uh, I, I, I sat at my computer and I typed her an email and I was, I was polite and direct. And, and because we had established a rapport in the workshop, I felt comfortable with her. And that's why I really was just like, Liz, we had such a great time together. Would you be my agent? And she wrote back, yes. Yeah, awesome. She emailed back, yes. So when I came back to LA, we connected. I got my headshots together, and, and I now have an agent. I, she sent me out on scrubs. I went to the audition. There were 20. I, 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 I went into, it was in the Valley, not far, actually, from where the casting director workshop was that I used to take. And if you remember, Jim, when they used to shoot scrubs, they actually used a real hospital that was defunct, but they used it, they had converted it for their set. And that's where the audition was, or like in the offices nearby. And I remember walking in and signing in on the sign-in sheet. And I thought, God, I'm, I was like number 20 on the sign-in sheet, I said, God, they see so many people for one line. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? Just for one line. I thought, God, if they could just call somebody that they knew. And when I had gotten the, the sides that the agent had sent to me, the, the casting director had made a note that this scene should be played like the guys on In Living Color when they do that sketch of hating being the movie critics. And I love that sketch, but they're very big on that sketch and they did the Z snap and they were just all over the place. And for some reason I thought, I bet you they don't want it quite this big. And it was just one line. So I walk into the room, into the audition room and it was Romano Benner casting. They were sitting on the couch and one of them asked me, Ralph, do you have any questions about the scene? And I said, oh, no, I'm good. And the scene is I am serving a piece of chocolate cake, my favorite, by the way, to Zach Braff and Matthew Perry. That's all I do. And my line is sweets for the sweets. And the casting director said, just don't make a meal out of it. And I knew exactly <laughs> what he meant. Because you know that all those people before me were like, sweets for the sweet. You know, it's going to be like, and yeah. they're going to say it slowly. Yeah. They're going to punch every letter. Oh, my sweets God. For for the the so sweet. Oh, sweet was going <laughs> to turn into three syllables, okay? <laughs> and in case you missed it, sweet. Sweet. Oh, sweet. <laughs> So yeah. you wanted he, it to be natural, like you would normally say it in normal conversation. Exactly. I stared right at the casting director. Sweets for the sweet. Thank you. I walked out of the room, left, 
went home. And then I want to just mention, in that waiting room, when I was signing in, I reconnected with a great friend of mine from New York who was auditioning for the same part, Ron Butler, who is in a, a an award-winning audiobook narrator now. Oh, sure, and, absolutely, yeah. And um, he was working at Disney at the time in their show, and we reconnected. We knew each other from auditioning together in New York. So that was a wonderful uh, reconnection. I came home, I emailed my agent and said, Liz, the audition went so great, thank you so much. And she emailed me back, the part is yours if they don't cut it out. And I thought, oh my goodness, is it always gonna be this easy? No, it isn't. But that time it was, I thought, oh God, I hope they don't write it out. That was on a Wednesday. Sure enough, on Friday, I was going to the set of Scrubs and had the best day on the set. Matthew Perry directed that episode. Matthew, Zach, and I, we played around different ways of me serving sweets for the sweets. We did it different ways. It was lovely and wonderful. I came back home where now I was, I was taking care of my father. And when I booked the job, I said, Daddy, I booked a job on a medical sitcom. And he lit up like a Christmas tree. Been like, yeah. He see. was he was so excited. You didn't become the doctor, but you're playing one on TV. <laughs> yeah, I'm right, I'm right. And, but what I said to him, Jim, it's like, Daddy, I'm not actually um in the hospital. Yeah. I'm working in the cafeteria, but it's the hospital. But I you're was still that's yeah. right. And, and I'm serving one of the doctors. And he was just so, so happy. And then five days later, he passed away while we were holding hands. Yeah, and oh, yeah. it was lovely. It was, so, I mean, I had been taking care of daddy for four years. So I, as devastating as it was, I, I mean, when it actually happens, it's like, wow, this has actually happened. But it was peaceful. We were holding hands um, as he was seeping out of life, the caregiver that was helping me with my father, uh, because he <clears throat> required that kind of look now. I looked over at her and she looked at me and as daddy seeped away, I was like, daddy. And he woke back up and I looked over at the caregiver and said, see, I'm stronger than a defibrillator. And even during something as poignant as that, yes, I find humor. Absolutely. My, my father would have loved that. And um, so it was a very great send off. How fabulous is that? I, I book a TV, a, a major hit TV show yes. on NBC. It's a hospital comedy. Um, and my he father, knew about it too. He knew he knew about it. He, he hung knew. on long enough to get that information, right? Yeah, and, and 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 we had communicated so much. He knew that he had done everything that a man and a husband and a father does, mm -hmm. and that's and we had that connection. So we had would be at peace, totally at peace. At peace, which and is he, rare and beautiful. He loved me. He supported me. He said he never tried to force me to be a doctor. He, my father always said to me, do whatever makes you happy. And yes, he, he was my staunch supporter, as my father would always say throughout his life. That's my baby boy. You know, um, that's of all the roles you've taken on and all the roles that you will take on. The caring for your father, one of the greatest roles ever in your life. Oh my God, Jim, you are giving me goose pimples. That's three uh, times I've done that to you. I know, yes. Third time's I, the charm. I know, yeah. <laughs> they, didn't, um, they didn't tell you what happens a lot on the Jim Masters show. To huh? show no, I, I had no idea. I'm, I'm, you would have worn you, long, you would have worn long sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm even more thrilled to be here. Um <laughs> Caregiving for my parents, for, well, first it was my father and then my mother, but because my father was first, I'll say this, 
it made me fearless for the rest of my life because I had to do things that I never thought I would be doing. I don't know what we as children think is going to happen to our parents when they age. Um, we think they're here forever. Here forever and everything will be the same and cookies will be in the cookie jar, a pot roast will be in the refrigerator. Uh, the, the more the, the, All those, the, the holidays, the Christmas, the and birthdays and everything that you grew up with yeah. and, and that made you comfortable, it, it becomes a habit. So when that changes, yeah, you know, it's, it's yeah. very profound. It's a, it's a wild adjustment. It's a wild, it's a, it's riveting and it's earth shaking in a way, uh, your father being your dad, you know, the a supporter, uh, rah, 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 a protector, uh, all those things, a comforter, uh, sort of, uh, if you're lucky, somebody who can reason. And when you're having a bad day, Hey, let's sit down and let's talk about it and figure it out. And when that goes away and then with the mother, same thing, if you're lucky and blessed, warm and loving and caring and supportive. And, <clears throat> and when that, and they've been there since the, you know, moment of your inception, and then they go away, it's a very, you know, there's a baton, a torch that is passed. There is a torch that's passed, but it is a riveting feeling. Um, you Absolutely. feel them inside you? Oh, <clears throat> totally, for the rest of my life. And I live in the house that my parents bought in 1965. They'll, will always be intertwined. There's just, that just goes without saying. The viewers are loving your kitchen. Tell us about the room you're in. Oh, God. Thanks, you guys. Um, this is our kitchen from the, the house was built in 1941. We, my parents bought it in 1965. And everything, the, the hood, the oven hood is new. This stove here, it's so fabulous, you guys. It's an O'Keefe and Merritt. My parents bought it in 1957, the year before I was born. We've had it all these years. I had it restored. Um, I want to just highlight the orange pot on the stove that was given to me by my very dear friend, Lucy Rogenstein, along with her son, Greg Rogenstein, and her husband, his father, Bernie Rogenstein, was my longtime employer in Manhattan, in the Gray Bar Building gym at 420 Lexington. And these paintings here, oh, yeah, the, above, the gray bar, famous building, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So those paintings above the stove were uh, paint, uh, drawings of uh, photographs of vegetables and fruits that my mother always had. And the pots and pans behind you speak for themselves. So thank you guys for commenting on it. I had, I changed the decor to yeah. make the kitchen brighter, and. Yeah. Um, and I what like the original kitchen. color growing up. Well, my mother had wallpaper on the walls. She had the wallpaper. And, and it was a it was a rust colored, it was like brick. It was yeah. like a faux yeah. brick wallpaper. The faux, the faux brick used to be the faux brick was big, the wood paneling was big. And there's the yes. orange or yellow or uh brown or olive green appliances were big too. We have, uh, no, everything you just said is what we have. Yeah. So, and then the wall, the yellow wall behind me, that was all those four by four tiles. It was yellow tiles, you know, back in the forties, how they did that. So I just updated it a little bit to make it. And my mother, for some reason, these glass cabinets behind me, she had wallpaper on those. This rust co colored paisley wallpaper, and I was like, was over the glass, over the glass to make oh, it wow. come. So yeah. one of my projects, I bought this solution at Home Depot to dissolve it and scrape that so all you off. Can see, see the, the actual, actual yeah. right? You know, because that's from 1941. So exactly. I wanted to bring that back. You know, so my mother had great interior design taste, but. Ours were a little different. Oh, they used to cook on a similar stove. Yes. Similar and, stove, yes. and what I like is it's two oven, two broiler, and six burners. So you don't always find that. Wow. Uh, today, yeah. And there are places here in Los Angeles that restore them. So 
I was very glad to keep it in the family. That is fantastic, huh? It's amazing that you know you you still have the house you grew up in. And there's a lot of love and a lot of memories in that house, huh? Oh my God, Jim! That's why yeah. when you said is it, when you asked me, is your father in you? Absolutely. I renovated the entire house from the inside out. As fabulous as my father is and was, he was a hoarder, and he saved everything. Like he or had, he would say, a collector. <laughs> he was a, he was a, a rabbit collector, collector. A veteran yeah. collector, <laughs> a seasoned collector. Yeah. Oh my God! It's so funny when I think about some things now that you brought that up. <clears throat> my father had X-rays from his patients. He saved all of his patients' X-rays. Wow! So there wow. were just hundreds and hundreds of these X-rays, like big, like bigger than eleven by fourteen, right? And I, when I took over the house and I had to get rid of so much stuff, I hired a, a dumpster, one of those football field sized dumpsters outside the house. To, there was just so much stuff. I didn't realize that I could have taken these x rays and gotten a monetary collection from that. I did not know that at the time. I just <laughs> a uh, monetary just, collection. <laughs> I'm like, yes, collection, Daddy. <laughs> since, since you collected those X-rays, why don't I just get the cash equivalent for it now? But I just threw them in the trash because, you know, what are you going to do? I remember the house before the renovation. Roxanne, oh my friend, Roxanne, oh my mom. I remember that. Oh, you guys, this is so great. I wanted to get up or just show you, like, I have one of those green. Oh, yeah, you, you can if you yeah. can move it around. Some of the guests give us a little tour. And they pick uh, well, up. I just, I mean, look at the, on top of the refrigerator. There's one of those green uh, strainers, uh, colanders, uh, not, not a colander, a strainer, a, a scraper for the vegetables. Oh, that's so great, you guys. Yeah, oh, my goodness, Jim, my friend Roxanne, who just wrote in. Oh, thank Welcome you for watching. Welcome to the Roxanne. Gym Master Show Live, Roxanne. Uh, nice to have you here. You're now a Gym Master Show lovety. <laughs> now, you've been watching this show for a while, right? I think you've been binge watching, Ralph, all these episodes before even coming on the show. And I thank you for doing that. That's amazing. Oh, God. My friends are so great to me. And Roxanne, it's so funny that Roxanne wrote in, is watching and I'm sitting where I am, Jim, because Roxanne stood right here at this door when I was moved back here. Listen, Jim, my father was a fabulous physician. But as dementia and older age set in, things fell apart. It changed. And this yeah. kitchen was a disaster mess. Oh, Rox Roxanne stood there. I stood over there. And we just said... Get a garbage bag and put everything in the garbage bag. Just go. Just go. Just do it. Just do it. And thank goodness the one thing I didn't throw away was the deed to our house. That would be. Listen, Jim, my father had things stuck and scotch taped everywhere in this kitchen, milk crates full of papers. And I found the deed to our house in the bottom of one of these milk crates. Thank God Roxanne and I hadn't thrown it away. Roxanne was in here sweeping. I mean, it was a major overhaul. Roxanne, I love you forever. Hey, Thank Roxanne. you for watching. Uh, <laughs> well, she's this, now a, a gym master show. Love it. And I was saying, you've been a fan of our show for quite some time. You've been watching all of our episodes, Ralph, huh? Mm, well, I watched several. Of, I watched the one with you doing that. Oh, well, absolutely. The one I watched in its entirety, and that's how I knew it really got introduced to you, was with Jasper Cole's interview. Mm -hmm. And as I told you during our pre-show talk, uh, Mel England, whom, oh, I wanted to. Yes, yeah, and as uh, a friend, yeah. Mel England is a friend. And what we have coming out is a film directed by Billy Clift, it's called Here We Are. 
they just finished rapping Mel England and Will J. Jackson, the producers. And Billy oh, Cliff. well, yes. Yeah. Love to get him on the show, too. Yeah. And, um, he was fabulous on the set. I am proud to act opposite Mel England and Sally Kirkland in Sally my scene. Kirkland. And yes. she's going to be a guest on our show, the incredible legendary actress Sally oh. Kirkland, this Tuesday. Oh, excellent. That's, she, oh my she, doesn't God. Do, she doesn't do a lot of this type thing, but she's coming on our show. Oh and, my goodness. Uh, I'm so good. glad I mentioned her to you. What yes. a coincidence. Now, she you know is what? a true Hollywood legend, huh? Ooh, oh, what? a true Hollywood legend and a star. And what I want to say to you, to your point when you were talking about uh, the Mr. Charmin guy and uh, the other at the Madge actress, Sally Kirkland is a workhorse actor, meaning she works all the time and will do major projects and shorter, uh, short films and smaller projects. And that's what makes her so incredible. Like Sally and I had such a great time on the set. And a great sense of humor too, huh? Oh, oh such a sense of humor. Oh, we, uh, yeah, we loved it. Well, plus, it was a reunite a reunion for Sally and myself because Sally had been a guest on Jasper Cole's show where I'm Jasper's co-host. So I had met Sally twice before. So I was reminding her about that. And then we were running lines for our scene. And so I had lines opposite the legendary Sally Kirkland. And I got to do my scene with Mel. Mel and I had never worked together before. So and oh, and it was my first time getting to work with Billy Clift. As my director, we had tried to do other projects in the past, and because of scheduling, it did not work out, but this time it did. And it was the first job, Gym Masters, that I did during the pandemic, Ooh. and which was very, very, it made important. Me, very important, but it made me very nervous. But Billy Clift, Will J. Jackson, and Mel England made me feel so comfortable. We had to be tested before. We wore our masks during the production. They served us a beautiful yeah. lunch. We were separated. We did all the safety things and all of us were unscathed. Thank goodness. But that was very lovely. And they all realized it too. They knew that I was very nervous. That you were uh, nervous, yeah. I. I applauded all my actor friends, colleagues, for their courage to report to set mm -hmm. and to maneuver through at that time all was still, yeah, it was, because at that time, yes, there was testing. It wasn't rampant like it is now. We didn't have the rapid test. I mean, there were just things that were different, but they handled me so lovely, so professionally. So, and I just saw a post on Facebook that they've just wrapped the film. Mm -hmm. So they're because it took three years in the making. Billy Clift describes explains. exactly right. So it's so great when something like that happens. I'm I met so Mel a few years ago, actually mm -hmm. in New York. Uh, at it was sort of like a pre-screening event for a show he was in, and uh, through my friend who is the uh, producer, Broadway producer Neil Rubinstein. I don't know if you know Neil. But he's working on uh, dangerous liaisons and a lot of other cool things that are coming up uh, Broadway off Broadway. So I was invited to go to through him to this uh, screening uh, at the cinema in uh, Lower Manhattan and met Mel and everybody else. We just stayed in touch and stayed friends. And then he came on the show mm. just you know, about a month or so ago. We had a great time as well. So it's it's a very small world, isn't it, Ralph? It totally. It, it totally. It is very small. And um, yeah, it's so nice to organically drop names. You know, I, um, like I said, real honest, people that you actually really you know, <laughs> really know, like I can text Mel England, you know, right. and I can, I can uh, run into Will J. Jackson when we were at exactly. a function, you know, or a Billy Cliff to give him a big hug when He's working with David Milburn's movie. And we're, we're, like you said, we're all, it's a hodgepodge. It really and is. It, it, it's so totally as you, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a creative hodgepodge of just so much talent. Yes. And we're like overflowing with talent. And 
we're all harnessing it and just channeling it and just getting it out there. Bringing it together. Absolutely. Hey, I want to go back in time. We have a little uh, clip here we want to show of okay. you doing your thing over the years on various okay. familiar TV shows and so much more. This one goes back a ways, but here is Ralph Cole Jr. with the exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> Did you notice that, folks? Uh Again, that's his excitement for being on the show tonight. He said, we're going to give you an exclamation point. I said, absolutely, we love it. Uh, here's Ralph doing his thing over the years, and you'll notice some of the shows, and uh, it's amazing. Oh, wow. Here we go. The trip down memory lane, Ralph. Okay. <laughs> Hang on. Sure you never saw these two here? If I have, not for years. You say that one's a judge? Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. May I help you? Arnold Rothstein? Ah, yes. The hotel's tawdry history. Arnold Rothstein fixed the 1919 World Series. He was murdered in 1928. He was murdered? Right here. At the Park Central. Well, I was just finishing up my shift at the gas station when the grandest Rolls Royce that I've ever seen with New York City plates pulls up. Oh. Then this flawless diva steps out asking mm. for directions. Where was she headed? I think I hear a car outside. Ding dong. I'm Maxine. Hey, guys. Welcome to Pride Casting of Hollywood. Emphasis on war. Fun and Ma'am, can you tell us what happened here? Y'all could just take a number until I get some crab rangoon up in here. Fantastic, right? Jill Bernhardt, DA's office. I had you in court a few years back. You cut your hair. Looks nice, girl. Hey, I you remember we settled on probation. Now you're back on Turk Street with God knows what kind of pipe in your purse. Who's your PL again? How can I help? You recognize her? No. But she's in the wrong neighborhood, that's for sure. Boys on this block like their women bionic. That one has all the parts the good Lord gave her. Can I help the next customer? Are there any more pumpkin spice? Do you do birthday parties? Can I special order three dozen and have them frosted like the gay pride flag? <laughs> I just love spaghetti. I think we'll have desserts in the master bedroom. Mm -hmm. Whatever you say, mine hair, your the man. Oh my. Has mommy been trimming your hair with her teeth? No. Not to worry, Ricky loves the challenge. So Charles, do we have a game plan or shall I just follow my muse? Can I get a Mohawk? No. <laughs> I think we should just go for something young and hip. Like your hairstyle. Sure, why not? You'd have to kill me. Excuse me, ma'am. I mean, miss, I'm looking for someone. Uh, his name is Andrew. Have you seen him? Hard to say, boo. I see a lot of lost boys this age. Good looking one, though. Someone special? Yes, very, and I'm worried sick about him. You might try the soup kitchen at St. Malachi's on 3rd. Oh, thank you, miss. Gates. Pearly Gates. Because you can't get to heaven without going through me. My girlfriend said there was a delicious scoop of chocolate in the soup looking for me. Hello. Terry Lisher, Detectives Jeffries, and Rush. Back in 89, you saw a hit and run down here. Big girl, Beulah Stifler. Dark days for me. You recall the incident or not? Big girl shaking like a leaf, but she took that other broad out. Bam! <phone rings> Come see my show at the manhole Tuesday night. It's slamming, girl. <sighs> and give Choco Love my flyer. Thanks, Terry. Tell me I have a cover, Matthew. We can't have a big gay wedding issue without a big gay cover. It's gonna be great. Don't look familiar, hon. Ooh, but those are some fine streaks. Who did her hair? Petunia, you are the dumbest whore on this stroll. Sorry, sugar. Don't got a name for you. Keep walking, girl. Oh my god, he's choking! Let him die! Let him die! I can't believe you got cake. The guy said they didn't have any. Just do what I told you to do. Sweets for the sweet. Thank you. Glenn. Hey, you're the guy performing tonight, aren't you? Yeah. 
can I get a picture? No, 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 no means no. And where is your teacher? So long, suckers. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness i can't believe you we what? dug that um, up we do our research around here <laughs> you wow that was really fun to watch um yeah. I, and everyone was like a great memory like i've been so fortunate in hollywood to have like these great experiences on set and working with people oh my goodness that oh lisa rodrigo oh thank you maureen um wow yeah this is exciting jim i mean well like you said before you you have structured your show to be like a talk show so when you said oh we have some clips from your past i thought oh i feel like that because you're like oh what are they going to show you know like which ones are coming up so that really was down memory lane we have something oh. else too that's a little more recent too uh in, you know, in addition to all these other shows, I mean, Two and a Half Men and some of the other things that we saw in those clips, uh, I mean, Dexter, NCIS, you've been on some major network television series as well. You saw a clip from Scrubs there as well. Uh, but NCIS and everything else, huh? Kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jim. Isn't that great? <laughs> Here's more. Here's let's play this clip here so folks can see something. This is a little bit more recent. Ralph doing his thing, and then we'll continue. Okay, hey, thank you. Look at your new bob. Do you like it? It's so short. This is how you're supposed to look. <laughs> That's what I thought. Gregory, oh, it. please tell me you're coming to Chi Chi's going away brunch. I'm in denial. He can't leave us. Gregory, you have to be there. You're the glue. You know I never miss a party. But, but Gregory, you're 3 p.m. Call Deb from Deb's Dance Factory. She owes me a favor. Oh, and no stragglers today, BB girl. It messes up my flow. Bernard, shoulders. I'm not a vampire. No need to protect your neck. And go. Two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, and go. Energy people, this isn't the DMV. Go. Two, three. Ooh, your hair. Be brave. <laughs> Are you going to come sweat with me or not, Miss Bangs? I'm known as America's number one beauty pageant coach. Number two. Hi. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Are there any tricks? You hear about like a Vaseline on the teeth, so the smiles or sparkles. You really use those? Yes, absolutely. Give me another one. Uh, we put double stick tape to keep the dress uh, adhered to the skin. Between Candace and myself, who do you think has more pageant potential? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with Candace on this one. <laughs> Number two, you just got crossed off my list, is what you did. <laughs> How did the proposal go? Would I be standing here with a ring if it went well? That was a rhetorical question. She just wants her money back. Right away. You ordered a chocolate cake and she's sleeping? No, I ordered a white baby with a chocolate interior. I don't mix chocolate and vanilla. Well, that's very racist of you. You have any idea how long it took me to bake this cake, girl? And then create? Do you think I just have random white babies strapped to the roof of my car? Do I look like a Mormon Republican to you? But this isn't what I ordered. I dated a colored boy once. It's 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 like I can I can hear smoke in my head right now. God, his name was Malcolm. It, he lives in, in Atlanta. Do you know him? Oh, Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen you here before. Am I that obvious? Who cares? I'm Jerry. Mind if I sit here? By all means. Antonio. So you skate? It's a way for me not to be at home. I understand. The truth is my friends are my family. Do you have family? Not anymore. How old are you? Oh, if you don't mind me asking. A lady never reveals her age. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> wow. 
you really excavated a lot of my work. It's so fun to just see it all flash past me. <laughs> <laughs> Through you and, and past you as well, which I think is fantastic. It just shows the breadth and scope of your uh you know, your talent and your abilities to play all these different characters that whatever they throw at you, you know, you'll take it and you'll run with it and make it your own, uh, which I think is really, really cool. And we have some more evidence of that with some of the photos, too. This is from that. Episode. Oh, wow. They're really cool, huh? And then this, too, this this we use this in our promos. Um, this was great. Was this from back from Dexter? This headshot, this was just a, uh, a routine headshot session back in the day. Back in the day. Uh, tell us about being on the show Dexter, because that obviously, you know, that has a cult following as well, had a cult following. Absolutely. Marco Siega was uh, my director on that uh, episode. And I got to work with my friend, Rod Keller, uh, the other actor with me, Um it, once again, it was an audition through my agent and manager, and I went and said the lines that you saw in the scene. I booked the role. I went to Warner Brothers for my wardrobe fitting, and Rod Keller walked in, and we were like, oh my God, did you get the job too? So that was so fun to see that we were going to be working together. And once again, we shot in Long Beach, and it was just a fun day of getting a job. The best thing for me as an actor is saying, you got the job. Yeah. That, that sentence right there is the most exciting. And then as Jasper always says, between action and cut yes. is when we are the most just vibrant and alive, right? Yes. So we, I worked with uh, the, the star of the show, as you saw. We... We all laughed at each other because we had flat abdominal muscles, and we were just very proud of that. And, six uh, pack. Six. Well, mine's not the six pack, but it was firm. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, and uh, we did our scene. It, it was really like effortless, to the point. Maybe one or two takes. That's a wrap. We're broken for lunch. And that yes. was my, and there's yes. my Dexter experience. You know, some of these experiences really are very in and out. Uh, Jane the Virgin that you saw, they were, everybody was so lovely to me. You know, that's what's so great when you're guest starring on a show. They they're treat you so, see you. They're, yeah, because they're excited that you're going to move their storyline along and enhance their production. So it's all yes. a great thing. Right. Absolutely. And it's a beautiful thing. And you learn something new on every set that you're uh, on, right? Every Everybody has their set. own way of doing things. Absolutely. There, I mean, nothing is ever set in stone in show business. No. There, uh, there, there, there is no uh, set way the way you find out about a job when you don't find out about a job. There's so many things that we, the actor, don't even realize. And let me just say this. I love being an actor, but there are so many departments that are needed to make me look good and for me to get that job. And a yes. lot of, it, it, I've talked about this with my friend Jasper so much. When you realize that you're not the most important thing there, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's such a funny dichotomy because- Not everybody realizes that they think they are. Yeah. They, they We've really all think worked with people that come in like, okay, now you could start rolling because I'm here. Yeah, or like, it, uh, we've been rolling for two hours. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. And this isn't your scene. You know, so, you know, so, but Jasper and I have said how when an actor realizes that- we are just one more component in this cog. Because when we, the actor, are sitting at home going, oh, they haven't called yet, why didn't I get the part of him? Yeah. The producer is in Australia because his wife just broke water. They lost their internet connection. Things happen. That's, that's why you not, have not heard yet. How often, Jim, have, has this happened to you or actors that you've interviewed 
where you have auditioned for a part and then two weeks, three weeks, a month, four months later, you're like, okay, we'd like to have Ralph come in for what? Oh, God, really? You're still casting that? So, so many components go into me getting to be on the set, but that's why I am grateful for yes. every single time I get to step on a set. Absolutely. Yes. That's the phenomenal way to look at it and to be my friend. Look at this shot. Oh, wow. Dirty talk. That's Jason Bogue on the left out in the green shirt and Jeff Sumner on the right. Oh my. And I taught right before your show, I was Facebook messengering with Claude Knowlton, who mm. also stars in this movie, uh, <clears throat> Dirty Talk. The, Jason Bogue and I had done a film years ago. Oh, you actually showed a clip of it. It was called yes. Flower Shop. It's the one where I'm saying, let him die, let him die. Because that guy, I, I, my character says that because the guy was holding a gun on us. So when he starts choking, I'm all like, yeah, just let him die. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but Dirty Talk. You're at the register, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Dirty Talk, that was, God, you have really, this really is a great walk down a memory lane. Mm -hmm. Look at this shot. Oh, wow. My friend. Ron you know who you resemble there, too? And I forget the actor's name. It's just the look and, of course, the glasses. He starred on What's Happening. Oh, yes. I know exactly who yes, you mean. I can't. Character on What's Happening. Yes. I can't think of his uh, real life name, but I know exactly the who you mean. The glasses and the look, the expression. Yes. I, let me tell you about this headshot. Oh, look. And the shirt is great. Oh, God. Thank you. It's a Tommy Hilfiger shirt. Oh, yes. And let me, tell, well. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you why this uh, headshot. Oh, God, Jim, this interview is amazing. Tommy this has a few of my 20s and 10s and, <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and well, yours too. <laughs> I, I love it. Exactly. Well, the thing that's so special about this headshot, my very dear friend, Ron Butler, Ronnie Butler, who I mentioned before, he's the award-winning audiobook narrator. He's also a photographer. And at the time, Jim does his homework. Yes, Sherry, he does his homework. Um, I was auditioning for a show called 20 Good Years mm -hmm. with uh, um, um, John Lithgow oh, wow. and yeah. Jeffrey Tambor. Oh, uh, what a combination, yeah. Directed Legend. by legends, directed by legendary director Terry Hughes that used to direct a number of Golden Girl episodes. I booked a guest star, well, I, I did end up booking a guest star role on the show, but before that, I had been, I had been asked to audition and I, oh wait, I, I was scheduled for an audition, but then the audition got canceled or got rescheduled. And in the interim, I was doing a headshot session with Ronnie and that headshot was taken in a park near a public bathroom, but the wall color was so vivid. And I remember saying to Ronnie, we have got to come up with a headshot <clears throat> that will make them cast me as the photographer for this show. And this is the shot that we came up with. And I booked it. And that was like another, it, it was like that story I told you about getting, writing, being a bike messenger. We totally manipulated, <laughs> the, we, we created a, a look that casting and producers would look at and go, he's the guy. Mm. And think about that with all the competition out there. We were like, we are getting oh, sure. you this part. Yeah. We're getting you this part and it worked. I wish, I don't know if he can do that nowadays with all the self tapes that are coming in from all over the world. You like but self tapes? Doing I it? do. I do now. I, I, <laughs> bought, I, I bought it Hold first. It now. Yeah, before the pandemic, it fifty percent of the industry had started using self tapes, mm, and right. I begrudgingly did them. But th at that time, there was sometimes an option: you can either go in person or you could do a self tape. Mm -hmm. And I would always opt to go in person because that's what I was used to. That's how I was comfortable booking jobs. 
I felt like, and, and, and I really shouldn't have had this way of thinking. Self tape should have always been the way we audition because that's the medium they're going to watch. If you're going to get cast and you're either going to be on film or on TV. So yeah. it makes sense that they would watch a tape, but I always like going into the room and I live in Los Angeles near, uh, uh, I'm in Windsor Hills, but I'm near Culver City. So mm. when I go to the valley and there's traffic and there's raining and there's a parking issue, it is a lot to get to do to go to the audition. But I still did it enthusiastically. Do it right. I would go and do it. Then when the pandemic came and we had to do self-tapes, I learned how to edit. I, I, I really was doing the tape by myself with nobody else. I um, had to learn how to do all that. And now I enjoy doing it because I don't have to leave the house. And it's fun. It's, it's such a fun feeling to be in your living room and to, and, and to, and to click on the sign off button going, I just auditioned for a national TV commercial or a movie. And because of all of that, they don't, nobody watching even right now knows if you have pants on or I do. They're exactly. just seeing our tops and commenting about liking our tops, but they have no <laughs> idea if, uh, well, you're if so funny. this is... <laughs> you're so funny because earlier when I said, oh, God, let me show you one of my green appliances. And you were like, oh, it's OK, Ralph, you can get up. People do that. And I was like, yeah, no, not such a great idea. Let me just turn the, the laptop. No, but I am wearing pants. <laughs> <laughs> that is oh, God, funny. thank you, Maureen. God, your your levities are just they're so pleasant. Enjoying it. And all the, oh, thank you, Christine. They They're all so are. Nice. Yeah. Oh, sure. Our viewers who follow along, right? Some of them have been with us 670 episodes, two full years, seven days a week live. Well, that's why I told you when I got to talk that's to you. not even my full-time job. I have a whole career outside there. Yeah, that's why. I mean, you're indefatigable. I mean, doing this and getting all the editing done and making me feel so welcome and, and having this great audience. It's, I mean, as one of your followers said, your research is incredible and that's why you're so fantastic you know to highlight all of us and to give us a platform in globally i mean that's a thing that's so interesting now like you talk about the self tapes and um our exposure and you're very enthusiastic about encouraging people to subscribe to our station and and watch our shows and go to the archives how great that people all over the world can laugh and enjoy and learn Inspired. things and be in everything and, and agree and disagree, you know, about things. And just and like me, I'm just um, a, a simple guy from Los Angeles wanting to act and wanting to work. And I, I've gotten to do that and I'm getting to do it. So I'm grateful. But to know that. I'm sitting at my kitchen table with my cup of coffee and talking to you. And um, it's just, you know, grateful, like I said to you during the pre-show that the internet is working fine and there's no like what happened kind of thing, you know? So, um, which is uh, great. <laughs> which is totally great when it works. I just had an audition yesterday, a callback for a Disney film and I was oh, the same type of situation. So, I, um, it, it was thrilling. They were so nice to me. We had so much fun, Jim, at this callback audition yesterday because I was in the waiting room. And so while, and they would put messages up like, hi, Jim is on deck and then Ralph. So I knew I had like a few minutes. So I had my phone and I was all like just a dancing away. Always like looking at the, the screen just to see if they were ever coming on. They hadn't come on yet. And then all of a sudden I was just into it and they were like, Ralph, Ralph. I'm like, oh, hey, hi. Okay, yeah, let me just turn that on, put that on airplane mode. Okay, I'm good to go. You know, so it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> You're very was... color coordinated. The mug is coordinated with the shirt. Uh, there's some things in the cabinetry behind you that are color coordinated. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, I love orange. 
Okay, so there's something that's in the mug on the right, and there's something in the canister on the left. Only you know. Um, <laughs> this is water. Is, is one a chaser? Or... <laughs> well, yeah, this is the, the coffee, and then I have a, a chaser, water with, is the, the chaser with the water. You know, <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, I've i yeah. always wondered why I had this affinity to orange. And because my father saved everything, as I mentioned, and uh, my mother did too. I found old artwork papers of mine to see like how much orange did I infuse into these things? Well, I found one, it was so great. My favorite number is eight. And I found one of my old art pages. It's eight cats and I used orange for all eight cats. And then I found the finger painting I made for my mother. And it was just a swirl of orange. And this is for you, mommy. <laughs> and so orange. Uh, you've had an affinity for orange. For yeah. Years. Yeah. Something well, how just, come you've never been on orange is the new black. <laughs> you are so funny to say that to me, Jim Masters. And I will hey? tell you why. Yeah. Why couldn't you have asked me this question when the show was still on the air? But, you know, I always thought that too, but a great friend of mine, a director, Gary Lennon, uh, was a showrunner on the show, a producer on the show, but it was a different time. I wasn't right for anything, apparently, for that time on the show. But when the show first came, so many people commented, like you just did, like, you know, I should just be on the show just because, <laughs> you know, we really don't have a part for you, Ralph, but just be on the show because so many people will understand why you're here. <laughs> because of the love of orange. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, oh, God, that's Jasper and myself. We were, this is, of course, before the pandemic. We were mm -hmm. at a studio, uh, Temple based studios here in Hollywood, uh, doing one of our live shows together. Working so, on. see, we could be brothers. We could be related. Hey, I was going to say, I know. And oh, Mama. Gives. Yes. And I, in fact, I just wish her daughter, Angela, and I are friends on Facebook. We did a reading years ago together. I just wished her happy birthday. And Frida Payne was also in that. Uh, Frida uh, was a guest on our show, and she was amazing. It was my oh, birthday and hers, and we sang happy birthday to one another. How oh, cool was that? Singing with Frida Payne, honey. I ate oxtails with Frida Payne, okay? It was Marla Gibbs, Frida Payne, Garrett Morris. We oxtails. had... Oxtails. Okay, well, because our... our, our <laughs> <laughs> you sang with her, but I had oxtails. Yeah. <laughs> our director and producer was so fierce on that show that instead of, <laughs> instead of having a catering company, they just cooked and brought the food to the set. So, oh God, I can remember this one time. We were on set and it was broken for lunch. And it was like, Frida was like, oh no, I can't eat that. No, cause you know, no, I'm watching what I eat. Until she heard oxtails, honey, we had to fight each other. To Dove get right to in, right? <laughs> <laughs> and of course she won, right? Cause you're a gentleman. Well, she won, yeah, I let her go, but I went back for seconds. <laughs> I let her go. <laughs> I let her go first, but I went back, you know. That is but, funny. Oh, my God. We had so much fun on that show. That's where I met Jasper. That's where we met Jasper. That is where I met. He had a client. Oh, that that's when I found out I was going to be on your show. On your show. And when you found out there was oxtails and you had to compete with Frida Payne to have them. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Absolutely. It's like, how many sets do you get oxtails on? Okay. We <laughs> Amanda Ardsma was in that production. We had so much fun in that show. Diva Perry was there. Um, this is what yeah. you look like when you try to put gas in your gas tank these days. This is the expression oh, you have goodness. when you see the bill. What was As this for? Thea Vidal was also in that show. This was just, once again, a promo headshot. Really? Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. In fact, I think Ronnie Butler took this. This is in my living room. You see how it is now, Jim? I mean, you know this. Look at where your background is. You have this lovely background for you. We are all doing, you know, okay, let me tell you about this headshot. This is truly self-headshot, 
this was my audition for Mr. Mayor. Mm. And I, when I was doing the playback of what I, I was watching my audition reel to, to edit it, to send to casting, I froze on this headshot and I thought, God, I like the way I look in the shot. I literally just took my phone, went like this, and that is what you have. And you took it. Wow. And yeah. So um, when they talk, it was so fun. Oh, God. Another promo shot. Ronnie took this one. Was this for anything specific? No, it's just like, I need to look professional. Yes. And I, I just need to look like, you know, now that I have my gray hair, I'm in my 60s, I have a different- 60s. Yes, I'm 64. So it's like, because of that and the hair, I have a, a different kind of persona. I'm still my fun-loving self, but I needed casting or anybody to, that was first looking to go, okay, he could be the lawyer. Okay, he could be the reporter. You know, the one where I'm pointing like this, you're not going to necessarily see reporter first. You're going to see a fun, wacky guy, which is great, that. But the one in the suit, you know how it is as an actor. You, you have to come up with headshots that are going to nail it for the casting. Because right away, because they, they it, have six seconds to look at it. They, yeah. they are just eating a tuna Standing sandwich down. and going through thumbnails. You know, we are looking for the role of a radio DJ. Uh, uh. Oh, okay, that guy looks fun. And I mean, like I said, there are no rules in this business. But, you know, I mean, come on, Jim. I have been in this business where I have been told, okay, Ralph, uh, we're going to need you to do another headshot session because we really need the background to pop. And it's like, wow, background to pop. Like, so let me do it against an orange wall and I'll wear a black shirt. But really is the wall the focus here <laughs> you know it's it's that old adage well if they're looking at the wall that's not really a good sign is it <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you yeah, know if you're only going to be focusing on that orange pot on say, my stove then right. yeah <laughs> yeah i was going to say that uh not too good right <laughs> <laughs> after all my training and and, and training. everything yes and you're going to be staring at a wall you know so what's some of the craziest things that have happened to you on set or while you're uh, you know doing different filming of projects anything oh, that stands out we oh, all have God. stories of craziness uh well um okay this isn't from a TV or film set. Could I talk about a theatrical? Sure. Okay, a stage, because I've done, a, as you know, a lot of stage yes, too. Okay, the one thing that stands out the, that you, when you ask that, that comes to my head, I was doing this show, oh God, it was in 1995. I was doing this show called Viva Las Vegas. Oh, and sure, it, was yeah. a, it was a takeoff on the, uh, the uh, Anne Margaret Elvis Presley movie. And we were doing it in um, downtown New York. It was at the Cucaracha Theater. And we had cardboard cars. It was just, a, it was a wacky, high tempo production. And there were like maybe 12 of us. We had a band. We were only supposed to run for like, say, a weekend. You know how in those days for the New York shows, it's like, okay, it's running for a month on Friday and Saturday nights. Mm, right. Saturday. We ended up running for six months. The lines were around the block. We became a cult favorite, Viva Las Vegas. And each of us in the show played like at least 10 characters. So, and backstage was mayhem. And so we were all in one big room and you had your area, each person had their little area. And it was like, you had all your costumes all situated and I'm telling you once the show started it did not stop mm. and I was backstage just a change into one of my outfits and I ran and I was in the wings and it was like I'm in the wrong fucking outfit <laughs> and I just had enough time to just move off to the side run back to the dressing room rechange and get on stage so but <clears throat> I always remember that because it was like, that's like when you oversleep. 
and that panic when you're like, fuck, the alarm didn't go off. That or, you, was- or you fall asleep on the couch in the afternoon and you wake up and you see it says seven o'clock, but you think it's seven in the morning tomorrow and you're going to be late. And it's only seven that you've only slept for four hours on the couch and it's still that same day. <laughs> And you didn't change the clock for daylight savings time. I mean, not that okay. that's ever happened to me. I read about that. I know. I'm I, sure I have a have friend, to. a friend who's that that's happened to a friend. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um <laughs> you've got a great laugh. Has that been like archived and used on I, laugh tracks or anything? Well, now that you mention it, Jim, I hope well, there's now some that voice. you mention it, I have a whole selection here. And, okay, uh, I, I, I'm happy to have it. If you'd like to order, you can get the okay. DVD set. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say for all the, the voiceover people out there and the Sound and Fury producers and just everyone in the voiceover world, yes, I have a hearty laugh, a loud-ass laugh, and I can do it for you over and over and over again. But uh, another funny faux pas. Let's hear some of those different laughs. <laughs> well, I really just have my laugh. <laughs> They'll just come organically, I guess, Jim. <laughs> like I don't have a planned laugh. It just you have a sinister. Comes. You have a sinister laugh. I. Uh... <laughs> oh. mm. Do you have oh. a laugh when somebody thinks they're funny, but they're really not, and you're trying to humor them? It's just a, yeah, it, it, it's just that a, just very, a complete like stop. Yeah, it's just a very quick. Um, you know. That's kind of like talk to the hand, not to the face. Oh my god, I actually use that line in Sister. Whoever started that one? I don't know who did start that. I know Vivica Fox did it. And I did a project with her, and she used that expression. And when I was doing Sisterella the first time in 1995, it was still funny to say that. Like, I don't know how it would work these days, but I used to say that playing Babalu. But I wanted to tell you about another faux pas incident I had. This was early in my career in New York. And I auditioned for the role of a tap dancer. And the thing is, I'm not a great tap dancer and I so wanted to be. I wanted to be like Gregory Hines and Maurice Hines and, and, and the, 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 the famous brother tap dancing team. Just, it, it, it's, so, it's such a happy dance. You're always happy. Sammy Davis dancing. Jr. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Oh my God, they're just, I mean, it just, the Hines brothers, it just goes on and on and Fred Astaire, I mean. Fred Astaire. It, yeah, yeah, it just goes on and on. Anyway, I auditioned for the show in New York. And like I told you, in those days, you were hustling. Yeah. We need a tap dancer. I can do it. Shit. I'll do it. They auditioned me on carpeting. Carpeting. <laughs> tap dance on carpeting. Tap a dance. And was it shag? <laughs> uh, like taboo? shag, right? Like, like shag or like a sh- the, the short crump rub. And was it orange? They- I don't think it was orange. <laughs> Thank you for that. Then they brought a little piece of plywood and put on the floor and said, now Over set up that. Over set that. That's how I auditioned. So my sounds weren't that great. And I really tried to be really Sort of cool. muffled a little bit. It was yeah. Really muffled, yeah. But I booked the job. I knew you were going to say that. It's like every single time that we've been, you've been saying this, this is like a running theme. But it's through a, all of this... Hail and fury, I still got it. I still got I, the job. <laughs> it's so funny how things happen. Like sometimes when you really want the job, crickets, you hear nothing. And the ones where you're like, well, I'm never going to get this job. They didn't hear right. the sounds. Yes. I got the job. I'm on the set now. And it was called the land. It was the land of dance and the land of music. So I was in the land of dance. Mm. And I had some lyric like, and the feet do the talking in dance and land, ba-doom, 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 with my feet, right? And I was just so awkward and clumsy, and I was trying to be, like, the singing part I was great at, but then when I would do the steps, it was like, ba-doom, 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 ba-doom. And then the director said, oh, listen, guys, we're going to need to get a boom on Ralph's feet so we can really hear those sounds. That's when the panic sets in 
it's like, oh my God, because there's nobody I can call. There's nobody that can save me. They are, they want to focus mm-hmm. on my tap dancing you steps. You can't phone a friend at that point. Yeah. And I can't phone this in either. And I sounded great on the carpeting during the audition. <laughs> but, you know, now I'm on a, a, a floor. Yeah. So, um, but I got through it. And through the yeah, marvels of that. editing, they were able to <clears throat> use the footage. Um, Literally footage. The footage. Oh, but boom, boom. I'm here all for the next hour. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> tips in the jar. Tips in the jar. <laughs> tip jar, tip jar Drink specials, two. two for one. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah. So I haven't had a lot of calamities. Working with the dog on NCIS was lovely. The dog and I got along great. The wrangler, the dog, rank, the animal wrangler uh, gave me yes. treats and taught me how to give the dog treats when you know, so after, after we shot us and do their camera, thing. Right. Mm-hmm. So that was lovely. And, uh, but yeah, the, my, it's my stage time when I, you know, just had a little bit of a run and I try to do what on the film and TV set, you just want to, I want to nail everything because I am, I'm not the series regular. I'm the guest star and I don't want to hold anybody up. Right. Because they're all used to working with each other. They, like, they have their little rhythm going. Like when I worked on Two and a Half Men, Charlie Sheen and I got along so great. But at one time we had broken for lunch and I was still on the set going. I was playing the hairdresser, you saw, and I was just going over my movements. And Charlie was like, oh, hey, come on. We broken for lunch. And I said, oh, yeah, Charlie, I'll be right there. You know how I am. And then I was thinking, oh, he actually doesn't. Yeah, because we just met. But I said, yeah, I'll be there in a second. But I just wanted to go through my paces. So when we came back, I was raring to go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's great working with all of them on Two and a Half Men, huh? In that episode. There's a funny oh. line, too, you say to the kid about the hairstyle. Oh, exactly. Yeah, no, John Cryer, Charlie Sheen, Chuck yeah. Lorre. I mean, um, everybody. We and uh, oh, what was her name? She just passed. She was on there too. Oh, Conchata Farrell. Another yeah. incredible character actor. Yeah. Many years. Oh yeah, from the stage. Yeah, really prolific. Unfortunately, I didn't get to work with her in North Holland, but um, I just I just saw to... her in an episode re-air rerun episode of Maud. Oh so wow! That's how, that's how far back she goes. Wow! And then there's Maud. And I then remember there's that. Maud. Yes, yeah, B. Arthur. I, yeah, and that's why I told you I mentioned Terry Hughes earlier. He did a number of directing the Golden Girls. So when I got to work with Terry, it's it's so great when I get to work with these stars and people in these high positions and knowing that he has directed so many episodes of TV shows, successful TV shows. And now I've been hired to work opposite him and, and to work with John Lithgow and Jeffrey Tambor. John Lithgow was so lovely to me because he did a show called Dirty Rotten Scoundrels on Broadway. And he was so fantastic in that musical that I used to always play the CD in my car. This is when I had my Toyota and, and they took CDs and um, I would sing along with him all the time. So when I got to meet him and sing along with him a few bars of one of his songs, it was just such a great moment. And Terry, I played the photographer. That was the show that Ronnie and I constructed the headshot for. And I'm now cast as a photographer. And the first scene, the, that shot, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for that callback, Jim. That uh, when the scene first started on the set, the upstage center was the fireplace mantle. And then the rest of the living room came down from there. And my character started up at the fireplace mantle. <clears throat> and Terry Hughes says to me, now, Rav, you know that this scene is all about you. And I had already decided that it didn't say this in the script, but I thought I am going to start with my back to the audience and then I will turn. So when I was upstage in position and Terry said that, I said, oh, yes, Terry, I'm quite aware of that. Thank you. And action. And the rest is history. 
<laughs> but you know, you know, to, uh, the point I was making was that they made me feel comfortable from the top on down yeah, to, to allow myself to have to, to to have fun. Yeah. And you've been having fun for a long time. What are some cool things you're working on now? I know there is something very special and near and dear to your heart that, uh, again, some folks may be watching this six months, a year from now, but for those watching live, there is something very important and special coming up. Tell us about this. Well, yes, I worked with this wonderful organization, Brothers of the Desert in Palm Springs, and they promote inclusion and solidarity and cultivating unity within the black race. And it's open to all, but it was established for uh, men of color in the Palm Springs, Cathedral City, Coachella Valley. And I worked with them last year in a play that was directed by Avance Jordan, written by Lorenzo Taylor. And it was a play that was uh, focusing on different prolific black poets and writers and activists who were all whom were all gay and each actor portrayed one of these artists i portrayed essex Hemphill, and we did this reading and it the reading was wonderful and lorenzo the playwright and in, has invited me back and i'll be attending next week actually um to do comic, to be involved, participate with a comic storytelling evening. And I have compiled, constructed, written existing material and new material that chronicles my life from birth until where I am now, highlighting my career highlights, highlighting how I started, how I've always been effeminate, how that has always been used against me, used with me, but has never stopped me. And it also uh, details the journey of a black gay man growing up in Los Angeles and how I have soared above all of that and become the man I am today that my parents were very, very proud of. And um, it's so eye-opening to do it because now that my mother is gone as well and I got to care for her for 17 years and my father for four years. So this culmination of 21 years of parental caregiving is helping me write these stories that I want to share with the world now. So that's what's very special because this will be my <clears throat> uh, first performance, public performance of this material. The show is called Make Me Masculine. And I am very honored and proud to share it and to share my stories. That's beautiful. That's great stuff, my friend. Really, really Thank is. You, Jim. Yeah. Kudos to you with all Thank of that. You. You're you're truly uh, you're enjoying it all, aren't you? It's uh, what are some of those continued blessings and joys in your life? I like to ask the guests this that continue to forge you forward in creating and sharing with all of us who you are and all these fantastic things that you do in the arts. It's such a great question because I was blessed to have a husband for five years while I was taking care of my parents. And I never thought it was gonna happen because I was parental caregiving for my mother at the time. And I knew everything that I had to do to take care of my mother on a daily basis. I didn't foresee somebody else joining me on that journey until I met Michael Kremen. And we met at a party at a mutual friend's party, uh, <clears throat> two people that I had worked with in this wonderful play called Dementia, ironically, since both my parents had dementia at the end of their life. But it was a wonderful production and I became and have stayed friends with people in the production, Sal Lopez and 
Giovanni Lucero, his wife, as the choreographer, Sal Lopez was, is a prolific actor, Sal Lopez. He and I star in Dementia along with the ensemble. And we met at a party that they were giving, Michael and I, and we fell in love. And he accepted my journey with my mother. He was part Nicaraguan, part Chinese, part German himself. He knew he had very strong familial ties. So I was blessed to have this man in my life for five years, but he succumbed to liver cancer. And <clears throat> he left us in 2018. So I have had the joy and honor of parental caregiving, including having a husband in there for five years, we were married for two of those five years. And um, that journey with those three people who love me so much will carry me forward forever. As you said earlier, Jim, yes, my father lives in me as does my mother and as does Michael. And as sad as death is, as inevitable, as death is, still devastating when it happens. But when you have complete closure with the person and unconditional love, it will resound in me forever. Every audition, every job, all my writing I'm doing, it all emanates from my parents and the love that I had with this man, Michael. So those blessings and living in my house that my parents bought, it's my house now. I took care of the house. I took care of my parents. My husband lived here. How grateful is that? I know what unconditional love is. How great so, thou art. How great thou art. Absolutely. So thank you for asking that question. Ah, yeah, well, that was a very uh, authentic and real and open answer as well. And thanks for sharing that with us because there could be people watching. I'm always cognizant of who may be watching our show, whether live or later, uh, who might be going through something similar with a parent or a loved one, a spouse, partner, whoever it may be. And they're, they're not well right now, or they've just lost them or what have you. And to be reminded, I mean, it's, it's, you're a source of inspiration showing that not this too shall pass because it doesn't pass. They're with you forever, but that you can continue living while still honoring and cherishing their memory as well. And that you can keep moving forward and creating and being part of you know, at the party and on the train and going forward in life, even though life throws these different things at us, they're all teachable moments and we learn from them. And, you know, it's a blessing to have had these people in your life as opposed to have never had them at all. There's others who've never had the parents, the spouse or anything like that. And, and they wish that they did and you've had them and you've cherished them. And, uh, I think it's a beautiful thing, and it's probably reflected in many parts of your work going forward, these experiences. You know, the things we have happen to us in our lives enrich us. At the moment, they don't feel like they're going to enrich us because they're not necessarily always the best. It's loss or whatever it may be. But we grow from them, and we, we absorb it, and we pay it forward in the expression of the essence of who we are, carrying their memory, but also at the same time, connecting to and relating to others who are going through similar things. And that's a beautiful thing, isn't it, my friend? It absolutely is. As I've had so many conversations with people, because all of us have or and will experience death of a close yeah. person. It's inevitable that that's what happens. But as I said to a friend recently who lost his husband, you glorified your husband so thoroughly that 
Oh, thank you, Maureen. I'm so sorry. I was just reading Maureen's comments. She's so, <laughs> she, she's so nice. Thank you so much. But <clears throat> while these people were alive, we glorified them. Yes. And made their, their journey as comfortable as possible. Mm -hmm. And now that that's done, let's glorify ourselves. Yes. Because they presumably would want that. And that is the nature of being a human being and life going forward. I, I can't remain despondent. You know, Jim, I, no. I say, I, I mentioned to you, I had complete closure with each person. And closure is what prevents you from hurling oh, yourself over the car. Very important. You know, um, important. It's, it's, and as cliche, as it is, you do have to tell everybody in your life right now how much you love them. Now. Because right, right now. this second, just say it. Even if while you're getting that hostess yeah. cupcake, you just say, I love you. And even they might look at you like, where did that come from? It's like, you know what? You, 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 you yeah. will know the, yes. the communication. And it's those, <laughs> excuse me, it's those yeah. feelings that will allow you to soar until it's my time you know i did everything everything came naturally to me when my father got sick i knew i had to take care of him when my mother came got sick i i was there that i had yeah. there was no choice for me yeah. they took such great care of me that this was natural it was the greatest full circle experience i could ever have Best you role, know, yeah. It, it really, really is. And, never and, scripted. And it, and never scripted. And like, it, it's like, well, when you, it's reality TV at its finest. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you said, going forward, and it's so true. It, these experiences influence how you are on screen and off, on stage and off. And going forward in your and life. Go, and you may not even be cognizant of it at the time. Um, you are, there's, there's just a new strength about, there's just something different about you because it's been such a profound experience and no one can ever take that away. And that's why I'm fearless, you know, and just with all the competition, with everything out there, I'm sitting here with you and the love it is. How did I get here, you know, it, it, it's that, it, it's getting that email going, hey, Jim Masters would love to have you as a guest on the, his show. Really? Oh, okay. I never take any of that for granted. And, and from this point forward, every opportunity I get, it'll always be like, oh, this is so great. Absolutely. Beautifully said. Beautifully said, my friend. And doing it with, uh, as uh, Lou Grant said to Mary Tyler Moore, spunk. <laughs> you got and spunk. I, and I love spunk. Yeah, we love head. spunk. You hated it, but we love it. <laughs> we, uh, we've got a special friend. I mention him all, all the time. He comes in towards the latter part, Mr. George Burns in the house. Hey. Hey, George. <laughs> you were waiting for him, weren't you? All the yes. guests do. If they see the other episodes of our show, they're like, where's George? <laughs> there he is. And he said, uh, you knocked it out of the park. There he is with a cigar and his red hanky, all dapper. And uh, he said you were amazing. And he thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, that it was a pleasure having you here with us on the oh, show. He said he's you. definitely a lovity. <laughs> oh, thank you. And say hi to Gracie. Gracie, and uh, we also have from Back to the Future, uh, <laughs> Mayor Goldie Wilson. I love it. Gone full of love. He, he actually was a guest on our show, and he sent this to me. I love it. Mayor oh. From Back to the Future, the movie. Look at that, huh? Excellent. There he is. He's part of our cast of characters. And uh -huh. there's many others, but just a few here. Uh, Gilligan is here. Oh, Bob Denver. Yes. Come, yes. And by his lovely wife, Dreama Denver, who was a guest two or three times on the show. Okay. Um, this was absolutely amazing. Absolutely loved it. And uh, good.
good luck with uh, everything that's going forward for you and for your life. And uh, let's stay connected. Let's stay in touch. Spread the word about our show to everybody. If you know, absolutely, you think would like to pop on the show, spread the word. You've got a taste of what it is as a viewer and now as a guest. So it's exactly. a full, full circle again as for you. Are. Exactly. Full circle in many ways. And uh, it was really terrific. I hope the show met whatever expectations you had and you enjoyed the time with me as much as I have with you, Ralph. Jim, it surpassed my expectations. Getting to be in the hot seat with Jim Masters was everything. So we are a good team. And from this point forward, we know each other. And at parties and functions when we're all talking around, it's like, oh, I'm Esther Turbulage, yes, hey, yeah, girl, I, I was on Gym Masters, girl. Carolyn, girl, I just did Gym Masters. Yeah, Mel, Mel England, hi, hi, listen to my show, I talked about you. You know, it is great. It's that hodgepodge we talked about. Absolutely right. Thank you for this, Jim. Ah, my pleasure. Any final words about our conversation or anything you wanted to share, my friend? Everybody, live and let live. I like that. Just a little pause, pregnant pause, we call that, right? Pregnant pause. Oh, oh, oh just that a was pregnant pause, just for oh, effect. Jim, just let yes. it, you know how it is. You just let, let it sink in. Let it sink in. Let it's it absorb. Because like, we're living uh, in such a fast paced world where you could say what you just said and people are like, huh? Okay, no. Right, so we very, want that to let that resonate, let that stew, let that marinate. Now, yes, slow cooker. Listen, I know how to be dramatic and theatrical <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, and manipulative. Okay, I'm vocally manipulative. You know, it's like, Say that five times fast. Yeah, you know, vocally manipulative. Manipulative. <laughs> manipulative. manipulative. But um, no. you notice when you ask somebody to say something five times fast, they always try. <laughs> <laughs> because we're competitive, Jim. We the other thing, too, have you noticed? There's so many things. I could do a whole show on this. Uh, do you, when did people start saying no problem? As opposed to your your welcome, I, I posted this on my Facebook once a few years ago, just as an experiment. I said, you know, I'm, I'm just curious as to when people started switching off from your welcome or my pleasure to no problem, because you know, if I if I thought it was a problem at the beginning, I would never have asked you to do it or say it or to help. <laughs> so, and the other thing, if you notice, a lot of people say, and I, I find this interesting. I'm sort of a wordsmith. Uh, journalists and all um when so, sometimes people when they answer like now, you, now you're going to notice these things more when people bring it to the attention you notice lately people when they answer a question you ask them something and they go yeah no <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah wait, no, wait a minute. Didn't that can't that cancels it out, right? It, well, that's zero. Yeah, no, it's like zero. <laughs> well, Jim, it, it was like before when you said to me, um, how would that laugh be? And it would be like, uh -huh. right. it's that. It's yeah. just it, it's very just, you know, I'm binary, so it's very black and white. Okay. Black <laughs> and white. Okay. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but I ended with that quote, live and let live, because it was my sixth grade quote. Paula says oh, Paula, hi. Thank you, uh, Roxanne. Thank you. Roxanne. Hey, Paula. Thanks Ooh. for being with us. We hope yes. you'll be with us again, Roxanne. Roxanne's now a lovety on the Gym Master Show. Oh, thank you, Roxanne. You're the best. Oh, we my hope goodness. She subscribes to the channel and she'll be with us more often. We'd love to have her here. Oh, um, definitely. Well, I, I chose, uh, thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. Um, I chose live and let live as my sixth grade graduation quote. They wanted us to choose a quote that resonated with us. And at that young age, I was very clear, mm. live your life and let other people do their thing. You don't have to hurt them. You don't have to shoot them or knife them. No violence, no guns. By all means, have differences. Let's argue. Let's call each other names if you want, but don't maim and hurt and kill and take away. So live and let live. It's my credo all through life. And that's why I've gotten as far as I have, because 
I haven't had a life of, of horribleness, right. but I have had a life of labeling and oh, I've, sure. risen, yeah. I've risen above those labels because I've claimed them. And once you claim the label, right. no one can do, they, you've, you've diffused it. You've diffused it, right? It's, it weakens their argument. Absolutely. What would be one sentence maybe perhaps that you would have to describe your experience with all of us uh, tonight on the Gym Masters show? Invigorating. It was exhilarating, informative, and allowed me to be myself on a platform that's global. You read that teleprompter perfectly. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you so very much. <laughs> You're the best. Thanks for being with us. High five. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Jim. Bye-bye, Lovatees. Bye-bye, Planet Eartha. Yeah, right, exactly. Although we don't say goodbye here, we just say see you later because we're going to keep the porch light on for you. You're welcome back anytime, my friend. And thank you, Jim, and I will be back. See you later, Levitine. See you later, Planet Eartha. See you later, Gem Masters. Thank you very much, Ralph Cole Jr. with the exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, bye, bye hey, Roxanne. It was a pleasure. Did you have dinner yet? No, not yet. Yeah, went West Coast, they never have dinner before the show. I should always tell them, eat something first. Do you know that we chatted for two hours? <laughs> and, and every guest says it never feels like that. I do, oh my goodness. And you said about an hour, right? Yeah. Too, too easy. Yeah, it was too easy. But thank you so much for this forum. I very much appreciate it. My pleasure, Ralph. You be well. You take care and continue uh, making the world a special place through your art and through your presence. And really a pleasure to have you here. We'll see you again soon, okay? Okay. Bye-bye, Jim. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us in Lovety Hall. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Ralph Cole, Jr., television star, film, stage, and so much more, joining us today with all of you, the Lovety Squad on the Gym Masters Show Live. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hey, gang, if you did enjoy this and you'd like to see more and you want to connect with us, hey, make sure you like this episode of our show. That thumbs up right there on our episode. Like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We would absolutely, positively love that. And that button looks like that. And there's no cost when you click subscribe. That helps us grow and build and allows uh, more people around the world to see these episodes of our show when you subscribe. It also lets us know that you appreciate everything we're doing here at the Gym Master Show Live. So subscribe, Click that thumbs up, like, and leave a comment. Drop a comment underneath this episode and all the episodes you enjoy. We thank Ralph for joining us here on the show. Ralph with the explanation point, of course. <laughs> Primetime TV star, film, stage actor, and so much more. A very open, inspiring, fun, and cool conversation. We absolutely loved it. It was really, really great. You know, we mentioned Sally Kirkland. She is a national treasure. She is an absolute treasure and she's going to be with us on tuesday that's right we're so looking forward to that look who's with us on monday michael Leonard. yes you know from the waltons extraordinary actress who played the mother olivia walton on that fabulous beloved series on cbs you know we have two shows double lovety two shows on monday which is incredible so I uh, hope you join us for them. This is first, and then right after that is legendary jazz trumpeter. He played with Quincy Jones, Frank Sinatra, Harry Connick Jr., Woody Herman, and so many others. Roger Ingram is going to be with us. So two shows on Monday. We have Gary Private joining us, actor, singer, drummer extraordinaire. He's joining us on the show as well. If you didn't see the episode with renowned celebrity fashion designer Wayne Scott Lucas, boy, was that a fun episode. That was last night. And uh, when A.D. Vaughn, Soul Diva, new soul R&B jazz recording artist, joined us on the show recently, Tonya Pinkins. You know her from All My Children, As the World Turns, and her riveting new film, Red Pill. Uh, that was epic this week. 
Patty Davis, author and daughter of President Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan, talking about dementia and Alzheimer's. She's got this wonderful new book, Floating in the Deep End, talking about the experience of dealing with her dad, who, of course, had dementia, Alzheimer's. Did you see the episode, The Dick Van Dyke Show, 60th anniversary? That was a great one. Kaja Pilowitz was with us. Yes, Bold and the Beautiful. J. Robert Spencer from Jersey Boys, The Midtown Men. These are all available on our YouTube channel and 670 episodes. Nick Endicott Gibb found out that his biological father is Robin Gibb from the Bee Gees. And he talks about that on that episode, Cousins Gibb. Those are just some of the guests that have uh, stopped by and graced uh, our presence with their presence here in Lovety Hall on the Jib Masters Show Live. Thanks for watching this episode, gang. Again, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. That really helps us big time. Thanks for all the interactivity and the comments uh, as well throughout the evening. Now, this was an incredible conversation. What a blast. Thank you, Jim. I don't know how you do it and how you do what you do, but I'm sure glad you do what you do. Thank you very much. <laughs> There's a lot of doing there. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thanks to everybody for all the great comments. You guys are the best. All the new viewers joining us and our regular loveties as well. We thank you for your time. Now, we don't say goodbye here. We just say see you later. We always say thanks for watching. You can check out the Dick Van Dyke episode and also the Patty Davis episode and 600, I think, and 70 episodes uh, or more <laughs> and counting that we've done thus far here on the Gym Masters Show live series. All right. We don't say goodbye. We say see you later. Shalom. Ciao. Cheers. Slancha. Hasta la vista. Avida Zane. Sayonara. <laughs> Ciao. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. This is Jim Masters. Don't forget to be well, take care of one another, love one another. And uh, we'll be waiting for you on the next episode of the Jim Masters Show live right here on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. We love you all. Take care and be well. And thanks for joining us on this episode. Cheers.